Welcome back everybody to another video lecture from Ms. Simino. In this series of videos we're going to be discussing states of matter and in fact in this first video we're going to be discussing the kinetic molecular theory as well as properties of gases. So I have this first sample problem here to get you thinking. It says you are walking your dog in the woods and suddenly your dog begins to bark and run toward what you think is a black cat. But before you realize that the cat is not a cat, the damage is done. The skunk has released its spray. Within seconds you smell that all too familiar foul odor. In this section you'll discover some of the general characteristics of gases that help explain how odors travel through the air even on a windless day. So remember the question I probably already asked you in class, um, if I spray perfume up in the front of the class, um, wh why do you eventually smell it in the back of the class and where would you smell it the strongest? So hopefully you're thinking or you responded in class to something that because of diffusion the particles of the perfume would move and get towards the back of the class and it's going to smell the strongest at the beginning because at the front of the class because there's the highest concentration of perfume particles. So our formal objectives for this chapter is to describe the assumptions of the kinetic theory as it applies to gases. We need to interpret gas pressure in terms of that kinetic molecular theory and we def want to define the relationship between Kelvin temperature and average kinetic energy. So all three of these are really important objectives so make sure that you um, are learning that through this video. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the kinetic theory and the model for gases. So you probably already know that kinetic refers to motion. So kinetic energy is the energy of an object um, it has because of its motion. And the kinetic theory says that the tiny particles in all forms of matter are in constant motion. And we've talked about that. Even though solids don't appear to be moving um, as much as liquids or gases, they still are vibrating. So all objects do move. Now we have some basic assumptions to the kinetic molecular theory. And these might be slightly different than the kinetic molecular theory packet that we're going to do in class. Um, but they're, they're basically the same thing. So the first one here, it says that gas is composed of particles, usually molecules or atoms. And that's really nothing new. But these concepts down here, these assumptions, are the important part. It says that gas particles are small hard spheres that those gas particles have an insignificant volume and it's relatively far apart from each other so the mass doesn't really matter, the volume's not really mattering and that these gas particles are far apart from each other and that we also assume that there's no attraction or repulsion between these gas particles. So the second assumption that we want to make as part of this kinetic theory is that particles in a gas move rapidly and they are in a constant, and this is important, random motion. So there's really no rhyme or reason to their motion. We want to say that they move in straight line paths. They're changing direction only when colliding with one another or another object like the wall. Um, for example, these are pretty fast speeds. The average speed of an oxygen molecule in an air that's about 20 degrees Celsius is an amazing 1,700 kilometers per hour. And sometimes we'll describe the path that these take, uh, these molecules of gas take, as a random walk. And this just means that the path that they've traveled in a short distance. The third assumption we make is that the collisions or these impacts that these gas particles are having are perfectly elastic and this means that the kinetic energy is transferred without loss from one particle to another so the total kinetic energy remains constant. So just I want to backtrack a little on those assumptions that we make. So when we talk about these gas laws in the next chapter, those are all the assumptions that we're making. Obviously, those are not all perfect assumptions. So that's why we sometimes are going to refer to this idea of ideal gas. So here on this slide, we have, we're going to talk about gas pressure. And this is something that you've probably um, experienced. Maybe you've had a low tire, so you needed to add more air to your tire because you had a low gas pressure there. So the formal definition or the chemistry definition of gas pressure is the force exerted by a gas per unit surface area of an object. And this gas pressure, this is the important part, is due to the force of the collision, so how strong those gas particles are impacting, and then the number of collisions. So these two things is what's causing your gas pressure in your tires. So increase these and we increase the gas pressure. 
And so that's why if we add more air to your tires, it increases the gas pressure because we are increasing the number of collisions because there's more particles. And we also might say that the gas pressure in your tires increases when the temperature increases because we're making those particles move faster, so the force is increasing. Now here's a term, vacuum, that you've probably heard before. And this is what happens when there are no particles, no particles are present then there cannot be any collisions and thus there's no gas pressure. So we call this a vacuum. So if we say something's in a vacuum, there's no gas pressure or air pressure and there's also no particles there. If we say something's in a partial vacuum, we'd say that there's low gas pressure or, or a few mo uh, mo air molecules in there. So another term besides gas pressure that we might talk about is atmospheric pressure, and this results from collisions of air molecules with objects, and it decreases as you climb a mountain because of the air layer thins out as elevation increases. So if you're going to climb Mount Everest, you're definitely going to need to take some oxygen with you because there's not enough oxygen at the higher elevation to breathe, and since there's not enough oxygen, there's less particles, Less particles means that we have a decrease in atmospheric pressure. Another term that goes along with gas pressure that you might be familiar with is a barometer. And a barometer is just a measuring device for atmospheric pressure, and that is dependent on the weather and altitude. And so if you've seen somebody's house decorated maybe in a nautical theme, you might see like three clocks stacked on top of each other. One of the, they're not actually three clocks. One of them is usually a barometer, and it can help tell you what maybe upcoming weather is. They're also sometimes in these glass containers where you might see a blue liquid, and sometimes a blue liquid will rise, sometimes a blue liquid will fall. Those are old-fashioned barometers. So how do we measure pressure? So the first device for measuring atmospheric pressure was developed by Evangelista Torticelli during the 17th century, and his device was a barometer. And barrow just means weight, and meter is to measure, so he was just basically basically measuring the weight of the air. And so this, his last name, Tor, Torricelli, here, you'll actually see this uh, unit of tors as a measure of atmospheric pressure on one of the worksheets that we'll be doing in this unit. More commonly, though, we're going to see gas pressure measured in the SI unit of Pascal's, and it's abbreviated PA. So at sea level, atmospheric pressure is about 101.3 kilopascals, and so we put the little K in the front of the PA here to represent kilopascals. Um, I mentioned that the tors are a unit of measurement um, for atmospheric pressure or gas pressure, but we can also use millimeters of mercury, which is abbreviated MMHG. We will use atmospheres. One atmosphere is like our standard temp our standard pressure, and that's abbreviated ATM. And both came from using a mercury barometer. So you can check out a picture of a mercury barometer, but as I mentioned before, it's just a straight glass tube filled with mercury, and it's closed at one end and placed in a dish of mercury and the open end below of the surface. So at sea level, mercury would rise to 760 millimeters high at 25 degrees Celsius, and this is called our standard atmosphere. So one ATM is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, and also 760 tors. Here's just a picture of how an early barometer works, if you want to go ahead and take a second and read this. So now here's one of those things that I would definitely encourage you to write on your periodic table, and these are just the, what these equivalents are for these pressures. So as I said, one ATM is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, and we also might say 760 tors, as well as it's equal to 101.3 kilopascals. So most modern barometers don't contain mercury. It's too dangerous, but like I said, if you're using one of your grandparents or something like that, it might, so be careful with that. Um, these new ones are called aneroid barometers, and they contain sensitive metal diaphragms that respond to the number of collisions of air molecules. And so this is the type that um, I'm probably showing you in class. So here's just a couple of pictures of aneroid barometers, if you want to go ahead and check that out. So continuing on with our gas pressure, it's really important to relate these measures to standards. So this is a term that you're going to see often, the standard temperature and pressure. So we have a 
our standard temperature is 0 degrees Celsius and our standard pressure is this 101.3 kilopascals or 1 atmosphere. Now here is our next objective which was what is the relationship between kinetic energy and temperature. So the question says what happens when a substance is heated? The particles are absorbing energy. So some of this energy is stored within the particles and this is called potential energy and it doesn't raise the temperature. But the remaining energy speeds up the particles, so the particles are moving faster. And you can think of this if you're boiling water, the hotter the water gets, the faster the water in the pan is moving. So this is increasing the average kinetic energy, thus it's increasing the temperature. So average kinetic energy refers to the particles in any collection have a wide range of kinetic energies, from very low to very high, but most are somewhere in the middle, so that's just what we mean by average. But what we say is the higher the temperature, the wider the range of these kinetic, en these kinetic energies are. So a little more about kinetic energy and temperature. So the big idea here is an increase in the average kinetic energy of particles causes the temperature to rise. But as it cools, the particles tend to move more slowly and the average kinetic energy declines. A question that you might ask yourself is, is there a point where they slow down enough to stop moving? So is there a temperature at which the particles stop moving? And so if the particles were not moving, the particles would have no kinetic energy because they would have no motion. And this term that we might use for this is absolute zero. And this is at zero Kelvin or negative 273 degrees Celsius. And this is the temperature which theoretically these particles cease. So nobody's actually ever reached this temperature, but we've gotten down to this small value of Kelvin. So you, if you were to write this out, it would be something like this. It would be 0.5, and then you'd want to go ahead and add nine zeros to the front of it. So it's pretty darn close to zero Kelvin, but never we haven't actually reached this absolute value or zero degrees Kelvin. So the Kelvin temperature scale reflects a direct relationship between temperature and average kinetic energy. So remember that means as one, as one value increases, as K increases, that means that the temperature is also increasing. That's what we're talking about when we say it's a direct relationship. And the particles of helium gas at 200 degrees Kelvin have twice the average kinetic energy of those helium particles at 100 degrees Kelvin. So it's a, it's a pretty even relationship there. So and finally the thing that I want to mention about um, this kinetic energy and temperature is that solids and liquids differ in their response to temperature so they're not exactly the same as how gases react but it is important to know that any temperature the particles of all substances regardless of their physical state have the same average kinetic energy associated with them. So the question that I want to leave you with is what happens to the temperature of a substance when the average kinetic energy of its particles decreases? So if our Ke or kinetic energy is going down, what's going to happen to our temperature? And I'm hoping you're saying, oh, it's a direct relationship, Ms. Semino. So our temperature must also be decreasing. So look back at the last slide if you weren't able to answer that question. And just a couple of uh, review questions here. We might call them like our class out questions. So what is kinetic energy? And remember that is the energy of motion or the, the how fast the particles are moving. We might look at the kinetic energy that way. And then how are kinetic energy and temperature related? Remember that they're directly re related. So as one increases, so let's say kinetic energy increases, the temperature increases. Or if our kinetic energy decreases, our temperature will also decrease. So that's the relationship that I want you to take away. And you're definitely going to need for the next unit on gas laws. Good night.